Good morning, everyone. I'm Tom Fitton, Judicial Watch President, with our Facebook Live Weekly Update here on St. Patrick's Day 2017. Happy St. Patrick's Day to everybody out there. Uh, as you might guess from my last name, I'm uh, more than a little bit Irish. I'm also a little bit Slovakian, but mostly Irish. So uh, St. Patrick's Day is a wonderful day uh, here in the Irish community here in the United States and abroad. So um, I'm pleased to be able to present to you, though, a lot of important work we've been doing on corruption that would make, make the saints cry, to put it charitably. Uh, we've got uh, a lot of things to talk about. The Clinton-Lynch tarmac meeting, remember that meeting between Bill Clinton and Obama's Attorney General Loretta Lynch? Got an update on what we're doing on that. We've done uh, important amicus litigation work on election integrity in Ohio. Uh, we had a Clinton hearing earlier this week, which may surprise you what went on there. Uh, I'll talk about, as I said, uh, as we, we noted in the, uh, from, in the, uh, in our headline, uh, we'll be talking about the uh, outrageous immigration rulings attacking uh, Donald Trump as well. And then there's a Supreme Court nominee uh, about to get a hearing next week that you should uh, be watching. Uh, first up, though, is our uh, efforts to figure out what the heck went on at that tarmac meeting between Bill Clinton and Loretta Lynch. Now remember, this happened back last year. I think it was June 2016. Uh, Bill Clinton and Loretta Lynch accidentally or coincidentally, however you want to term it, had a meeting on Loretta Lynch's plane just a few days before uh, Hillary Clinton was to be interviewed by the FBI over her email practices. And uh, Loretta Lynch herself said that that meeting uh, which many people were outraged by, justifiably so, because Bill Clinton at the time was both a potential witness and subject of any serious criminal investigation, assuming what was taking place. Uh, but Loretta Lynch even admitted that uh, that meeting cast a cloud over the investigation. And uh, it was shortly after that meeting, and my guess is Bill, uh, the d director of the FBI uh, Comey uh, looked at that meeting as further indication there was never going to be a prosecution at the Justice Department, and I'm convinced that's in part why he um, uh, suggested that uh, Hillary Clinton shouldn't be prosecuted, since she knew, he knew Hill, uh, the Justice Department wasn't going to prosecute her. Not that it justified what Comey said, but boy, what, what a corruption of the justice system, uh, having that meeting in such an audacious way, and it was only broken thanks to... Uh, I would suspect that someone leaked the fact that it was happening to a local reporter out there who uncovered it uh, in Phoenix. Uh, we asked for these records back in June of last year, and we sued for them, I think we sued last week or this week for them, under the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, so where are these records? That's what we want to know. And you can bet there are records uh, of, of a meeting like that. There was a, however the meeting was set up, and, of course, given the controversy, there had to be records about what went on after the fact. You know, by the way, we had asked the Department of Justice Inspector General to look into this. Uh, no word on that. Uh, so, again, it's going to be up to Judicial Watch to do the investigation here. And if you want to know why Americans don't trust the justice system, and if you want to know why Americans think that the criminal investigation into Hillary Clinton was rigged, all you need to do is to look at this meeting between President Bill Clinton, and his spouse, her spouse, someone involved in a scandal, uh, at least as relates, relates to the foundation and the play-to-play -play scandals at the State Department, and Loretta Lynch, the Attorney General. Now, Attorney General Lynch never recused herself from the Clinton investigations or prosecution decisions, even though, uh, her, as she said, her meeting cast a cloud over said investigations. Uh, so that's the Obama Justice Department we're talking about. So the next time you hear the left says, oh, well, how could anyone believe the Obama Justice Department would um, do anything untoward towards President uh, Trump or his incoming team? Just think back to that meeting. I dropped my notes here. I don't know where they went. One second. And uh, so we're going to be pursuing that FOIA in open court. And, of course, now it will be up to the Attorney General of the United States, the lawsuits against the Justice Department, and the new Justice Department Attorney General is Jeff Sessions, and he's going to have to uh, uh, decide whether his agency is going to continue to stonewall like the Obama gang has. And I hope there's a new day in transparency 
when it comes to uh, uh, the Freedom of Information Act from the Trump administration, uh, because it hasn't happened yet. As I said at, at the top of the uh, uh, segment here, we uh, were in court earlier this week on another important case, which I think I discussed last week, which was the State Department is in litigation with Judicial Watch over their failure to send a letter as required by federal law or a request as required by federal law to the Justice Department to try to get Hillary Clinton's emails. So in other words, if an agency finds out records went missing or were taken and they don't have access to them and they need to get them as the law requires, either under the Freedom of Information Act or the Federal Records Act and things like that, they're supposed to t alert the Justice Department to that. Well, the State Department has steadfastly refused to do that. And it's no surprise they didn't want to do that during the Obama administration. But they were in court this past week after he had won on appeal. A court had ruled they didn't have to do it. And the appellate court said, wait, wait, it says shall. And it's not mooted out, as the Justice Department alleged, or the State Department alleged, because uh, unless there's nothing possible the Attorney General can do to get this information, uh, Judicial Watch and Cause of Action, the other group that's suing on this, uh, should be able to proceed with this litigation and get this letter done. But the Justice Department and the State Department, what happens is you go into court and the Justice Department represents the State Department or the agencies we're suing. So it's kind of, a, that's why I use both agencies oftentimes when I talk about litigation. So anyway, we go in and the State Department's legal position is no different than the Obama administration's legal position. They don't want to do anything more on the Clinton emails. They don't think they should have to request the Justice Department. Uh, and... Uh, so the concern is this is the Trump administration now. And I recognize the Trump administration doesn't have all their people in place. I often observe we're still waiting for the Trump administration to come to power. Uh, but during this transitional period, uh, and I hope it's a transitional period, I hope this doesn't become the policy of the administration over the long haul, uh, we're facing the same set of legal positions that the Obama administration had on key transparency issues, which is... The illegal positions tend to be obstructionist, make Judicial Watch wait forever and a day for good records, and uh, just stonewall everything and make us fight tooth and nail in court uh, just to get the time of day from these agencies. Uh, and it, unfortunately, it, nothing's changed during the Trump administration. So let's hope that does change, and we're trying to uh, try to get it changed, and we're hopeful uh, that some folks in the White House and the Justice Department and the agencies finally take notice to say, hey, we got to start enforcing the Freedom of Information Act the way we're enforcing our immigration laws finally. Let's start enforcing the rule of law on transparency. And, you know, that goes for this issue, Clinton emails. That goes for uh, the Russia scandal because uh, President Trump may, has it within his power to release all these records to uncover who illicitly leaked and should be prosecuted uh, for, um, or I, I think the records will show who illicitly leaked. Uh, illegally leaked, I shouldn't say illicitly, that's even too kind a word, illegally leaked the surveillance of the Trump operation. And uh, I think this power is something the president has to take advantage of, and his agencies need to start paying attention to the public interest in getting this information out. And uh, no matter what the administration does, and this is what I love about Judicial Watch, we're going to be in court pushing for disclosures. So we're hoping to get a little help from those in the government, finally, who might believe in the rule of law. But even if they're too busy, or frankly, they don't feel like doing anything, or maybe obstruct us, we're still going to be in court. Uh, and uh, so it's going to come out one way or another, however difficult it may be. Uh, secondly, uh, the voter fraud crisis, the voter integrity crisis that we've been talking about. We had a great panel discussion on it a few weeks ago, which is available on Facebook Live and uh, on YouTube and such. Uh, you know, we haven't slowed down a bit on this. Uh, we've got a lot of things planned. Uh, but uh, one of our key cases on this occurred back in 2012, where we uncovered that many states had more people on the rolls than they had registered to vote. Think about that. More people on the rolls than were registered, to, than were eligible to vote, excuse me, in their jurisdictions. So that means they had dead people on the rolls, or people who moved away, or people who... Uh, were registered in more than one place, and it shows you they weren't taking the steps required under federal law, which means, uh, and I'll, the quick summary of the federal law is that states have to take reasonable steps 
to clean up their voter roll. And uh, so we sued Ohio and Indiana over that. And those were the first private lawsuits enforcing that law because, as you might imagine, the Obama administration likes dirty voting rolls. Uh, the left likes the ability to be able to steal elections. So it was Judicial Watch who had to do the work of the government. And, uh, but, of course, uh, we did get a, a settlement with Ohio, which ended the lawsuit, and uh, which required, um, I think Ohio did one additional mailing to uh, voters or registered voters to ascertain whether they were still there or not. That's all. Of course, the left didn't even like that. So they sued in Ohio, and they challenged uh, some of the good things we were able to accomplish as a result of our litigation. And uh, long story short now is the uh, left has won, per, uh, at least at the appellate court level, now it's going to be up to the Supreme Court whether they're going to enforce the rule of law here, and that's why we filed a petition, uh, 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 a, a, a uh, amicus curiae brief, uh, in support of the uh, effort to appeal uh, for Ohio. Um, the Sixth Circuit is the circuit that uh, took care of this case. It was a 2-1 ruling, so there was a split, and so again, this is the left attacking Ohio over its efforts to clean up the rolls. You had federal courts get in the way of efforts to clean up the rolls. The rolls aren't perfect, by the way. And now it's going to be up to the Supreme Court to uh, hopefully vindicate the right of Ohio to take these sensible steps to clean up the rolls. Uh, but it was Judicial Watch that was in the middle of this fight to begin with, and we're hoping the Supreme Court pays attention to our amicus brief. And... Um, you know, it's a, uh, it's a real issue because, uh, and this is maybe something you may not know, but it's not it wasn't just in Ohio and Indiana. The states across the country had this problem, and many of them still have it. I mean, in California, I don't think they take anyone off the rolls. You just show up. You could have been, you, have, you may not have voted in 15 years. You show up, and uh, you, you vote. And it's even worse if these states don't have voter ID. So if you know someone is dead, can show up and say, I'm that dead person, and vote, or request an absentee ballot in that dead person's name and vote. I mean, there are all sorts of opportunities for fraud as a result of having, as a result of having dirty voter rolls. Dirty voter rolls mean dirty elections. And um, once again, the left is on the side of dirty elections here. And so, uh, you know, the law at issue here is the National Voter Registration Act, and there are two components. There's the, uh, it's, more, it's typically known as the Motor Voter Bill, where you get to register to vote when you uh, get a driver's license. And, of course, the left likes the idea of any public service giving you the opportunity to register to vote. So if you go in for food stamps and things like that, they often also encourage you to register to vote. And the compromise was, okay, we'll have that provision of the law where everyone gets registered or there's this opportunity for fraud because so many people are getting registered by the government. Uh, but the states also need to take reasonable steps to make sure the rolls are being cleaned. Well, guess which part of the law the left wants enforced? Only the, oh, the registration part. They don't want to enforce the cleanup part. And uh, that's where Judicial Watch has been taking key steps. And we're going to be doing more of that work this year. And uh, so we may be coming to a state near you. Uh, but track, our, track us here on Facebook and on, on, the inter, uh, on our website for more on that. Um, oh, the immigration rulings. Almost forgot. Terrible immigration rulings. You had... Actually, a few judges in the Ninth Circuit uh, highlight the fact that, hey, to their colleagues, let's not go overboard with this anti-Trump stuff. Put your, uh, the fact you don't like President Trump aside or the fact you disagree with his policy aside in your rulings. And we had a terrible ruling, for instance, out of Hawaii, which knocked back Obama's, uh, excuse me, President Trump's latest iteration of his executive order uh, uh, temporary pa temporarily pausing uh, immigration from terror-controlled uh, uh, terror countries, more or less, in the Middle East. And uh, this, the U.S. District Court judge in Hawaii, an Obama appointee, uh, said Hawaii had an interest in, had standing because there were Hawaiians who might be offended by this. If you think I'm exaggerating, read the ruling. He also said the individual might have... Uh, uh, no, that Hawaii might also have standing because there were 70 less tourists from Hawaii in January of this year than January of last year. 
70. I mean, I went back and read that passage three or four times because I couldn't believe it. And then he suggested that it was because uh, President Trump doesn't like Muslims that he couldn't keep uh, terrorists out of the country. I mean, that, that's the, that's the that's generally speaking, what the uh, ruling has uh, practically uh, impacted the immigration policy as, meaning no one can be stopped from coming in, practically speaking, because President Trump is alleged, using pretty weak arguments, to not like Muslims. President Trump doesn't like Islamic jihadists, and he recognizes it's hard to keep straight who's a bad guy and a good guy in the Muslim community, especially in these countries where terrorism is running amok. And so we need to have a process in place to make sure we can, make sh we can figure out who the good guys and bad guys are. And the judges want no part of that, and uh, it's activism run amok, it's political anti-Trump judicial decision making. Uh, we're investigating, and we plan to investigate what the states are doing with this coordinated effort to take on Trump and the rule of law here. Uh, but it's really troubling. I mean, under the logic of this ruling and other rulings, uh, the courts can go after Trump for going to uh, prosecuting the wars in Syria or Afghanistan because, you know, are they motivated by Muslim bias? I mean, that's crazy town. And this is where we are with courts that are acting like politicians as opposed to uh, the judges we expect them to be, which who are just passionate, neutral, apply the law, and don't mistake their own points of view for what the law should be. I mean, that's the toughest thing for a judge to do, which is to uh, disagree with a policy but uphold it legally. It's tough for conservative judges to do, and it's tough for liberal judges to do. And, you know, I recall, and if you haven't read the book, it's probably worth reading. It's uh, Judge Bork's The Tempting of America, the late Judge Bork. And that was the temptation he was referencing. The, the temptation as a judge to, to uh, mistake your own points of view for what the law is and how it should be applied. Uh, so we'll be tracking that. We probably will file an amicus brief or two. But we're also going to be doing some interesting FOIA work around this crisis uh, caused by the court's interference in the constitutional duties of the president. Uh, to protect the country from uh, foreign threats. Uh, it's just uh, absolute insanity in some respects. Uh, Judge Gorsuch, uh, the president's nominee for the Supreme Court, is getting his hearing finally before the United States Senate, uh, the Judiciary Committee, next week. Now the question is, is he going to be confirmed? And I think he generally will be confirmed. But let me just say, you know, conservatives who think just because Republicans control all branches of government, at least the the legislative and executive branch, all everything good will happen. You know, we've seen with Obamacare, that's not the case. We were told, well, once we control everything, we'll get everything we want. Uh, or conservatives will get everything they want, because as you know, conservatives are different than Republicans oftentimes in policy. And, uh, you know, Judicial Watch uh, doesn't care about the politics in the sense of Republican versus Democrat. We just want judges on the court who aren't politicians who are going to apply the rule of law as opposed to uh, 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 be politicians in robes. And we appreciated that Judge Gorsuch is not just another politician. He's a judge who takes his role seriously under the Constitution and, and doesn't seek uh, to be a, a, a super politician on the bench. Now, the Democrats are concerned about Judge Gorsuch for reasons that uh, you know are, would be rather obvious to those following these, uh, these issues. But the question is, are they going to allow an up or down vote on Gorsuch, or are they going to filibuster him? And I don't know whether that's going to happen or not. But the fact uh, is that his uh, nomination, or the approval of his nomination, is by no means guaranteed. And if you have views as to whether his nomination should proceed, uh, you should um, contact your United States Senator at 202-224-3121. Uh, that's 202-224-3121. Uh, and that will give you uh, the U.S. Capitol operator and should talk to your senator's offices about how you feel about Judge Gorsuch and, frankly, how the nomination processes are proceeding in the Senate generally. You know, I talked earlier about we're still waiting for the Trump administration to come to power. He still has a few cabinet officials that haven't been approved for no good reason. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are hundreds of lower-level officials that have to go through uh, confirmation on, by the United States Senate and at this rate, he won't get any of those folks approved uh, until, uh, as I jokingly say, uh, the Chelsea Clinton administration. 
I mean, it will take that long. Uh, so there's a real crisis caused by the Senate's failure to move quickly, and it's partisan. The Democrats are doing what they can. He has a minority party. Uh, and some of it uh, is on President Trump in the sense he should increase the pressure on the Senate by getting more nominees forward more quickly because he hasn't made all the nominees he needs to make uh, yet. Uh, he's behind on that. And um, so it's a big issue, and uh, it's something to track. Uh, and, it, and it has consequences because they only have a few people at all of these agencies. And I was telling a reporter the other day, you know, I, I, you know Jeff Sessions, I'm sure there's only, uh, he doesn't have his, the top deputy under him confirmed yet. And as you know, the bureaucracies, we talk about the deep state, the alt government, these bureaucracies hate Trump, they hate conservatism, they hate reform, they don't want to see their budgets cut, they don't want to see their expansive powers under the uh, 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 massive administrative state uh, curtailed. And uh, so the few Trump appointees in these agencies, to the degree they're good, not all of them are good, some of them are better than others, but the good ones, they're like riding tigers that want to devour them. That's what the bureaucracies are like. And so until uh, we get enough political appointees there that share our values, we have to be sure they share our values. And just because the president nominates them doesn't mean they're always the best person. Uh, and it uh, doesn't mean they don't need pressure even to do the right thing if they are good people. Uh, but uh, we certainly need representatives of the elected president of the United States and the administrative agencies if we're going to have self-governments in this country. Uh, and we don't right now. And it's a real, it's a real crisis because there's been no other presidency, um, no other presidency. I think I can fairly say no other presidency, not in recent memory, but none in the history of the United States, that it's not the president's nominees have been so severely slowed down as this one. So a lot going on. We're on the Clinton Lynch tarmac. Immigration, voter rights. We need more transparency, finally, from this administration. Uh, the immigration crisis continues, and the Gorsuch nomination is up next week. A lot for you to pursue as well. I've given you your charge in terms of your personal activism, and we'll keep up the pressure here at Judicial Watch. Thanks for joining us, and again, have a happy St. Patrick's